Um, I'm really delighted to be here and to be able to say something about Julia. And there'll be some recurrent themes here. Because I first met Julia at the beginning of 1983, when I came to the Thomas Coram Research Unit to be an early career researcher on a project that Peter Moss uh, had got funded and was the PI for, and that Julia was a senior researcher on. And we shared a room. And that was very lucky for me. Because, for a number of reasons, but two of them were that Julia was somebody who has always been able to take the personal and turn it into the theoretical and help you see things differently. So actually, I called my contribution Reframing Relevance, but didn't mention those personal issues. Julia's always reframed the personal, so that when things happen and so on, she was always able to say something that actually, in an old-fashioned way, one could say is wise, but is also very much theoretical. And then also, she modelled for me. Actually, I don't believe in role models, um, theoretically, but... <laughs> <laughs> Having said that, uh, Julia very much modelled for me how to do a research career successfully. She was very well connected. She forever organised things, which is what I remember, that I could attend that really took my thinking forward. So, for example, the narrative project that I'm doing now was hugely influenced by her bringing Martine Burgo over to the United Kingdom and our having a workshop that stayed with me ever since. And I've, periodically I search for publications by Martine Burgo and never find any, but I have my notes, which I've since typed up and written up on that. It's really been key to my understanding of narrative and to the sort of narrative that I like. But also, workshops that Julia organised, both on mixed methods and the work she did with Gail, Gail Wilson on um, resources within households and so on, as well as the wonderful uh, seminars that we had at the unit and that, that we more often gave, so that Julia would give some. So she, she modelled for me the best of an academic career. And she was also very kind. She still is. That hasn't changed. <laughs> And so, so that um, she was very easy to be with. And I was constantly admiring of her erudition. She would come in and talk about a place she'd been to, or you know, art or something, and forever draw links between social research and plays, theatre in particular, but also poetry and so on. So that she was an ideal person to share a room with. And she continued to share a room with me until computers were introduced. Uh, that, that might seem very strange to, to everybody. But when they were, we were learning to type. And Julia's <laughs> laughing. And I had a style of beating my computer <laughs> keys. And it didn't take long till Julia decided she could not bear to share a room <laughs> with a tap, tap, tapping noise anymore. So we had a good few years, and then Julia moved out, and quite rightly got a room of her own. <laughs> but we remained friends, and that, that glosses a great many personal things. You know, perhaps just to say that she was somebody who I found uh, that it was fine to have come to my bedside when I was very seriously ill in hospital. Mostly, I said to people, they couldn't come to hospital, and very few came to my house afterwards because I was, you know, very ill and very weak. But Julia both could come and could take it, you know, even though I think that she found the, the experience very distressing. Um, you know, it says a great deal ab about her. That, ex that expresses the personal. OK, um, so thank you, Julia. I'll say that as well now. You know, you, you are a gem in many ways. I want to do two things in this talk. Firstly, briefly, to say something about the themes in the paper I wrote, but not to reprise the paper. It exists. And to start with, as, as indeed the paper does, with a few of Julia's own words from her professorial lecture. Broadly, my own research can be described as a study of family lives. Everybody said that so far. Though at different times, I may have described it differently. And I think that that's really key, that reframing is also rethinking one's own career. I've studied lives lived in contemporary time, okay, 
as I look back, I'm struck by the particularity of the historical periods in which I undertook the research, which was not at all obvious to me then in the way it is now. I've also become conscious that time has been a central theme in my research, and Ross said that right at the start, that time was a central theme, but also that this continual reframing and Julia being able to think about her career as a whole. The transition to new life course phases has been a persistent interest. And then later on in that same bit, she talks about generation being absolutely key. So looking back, thinking differently, and so on. So some of the headlines in my paper were about the way in which, actually perhaps surprisingly, contract research facilitated Julia's research career. Now that may sound odd to the many of us who've struggled in social research. And uh, I'm forever grateful to Basil Bernstein, who was Julia's mentor and friend, who uh, I was on a committee that he organized in the early days at the Institute. When I say in the early days at the Institute, I mean my early days. I'm just being <laughs> egocentric. And um, uh, one of the things that he came up with was the notion of uh, the way in which researchers were continually living temporary lives and um, that this was just not good, you know, sort of, so that things ought to be done to give us a bit more security and to keep more of us around. So, you know, tough times and lots of our colleagues, you know, are in the room here and those who are in the room are those who, one, a struggle to stay for, you know, some time in the unit. There are, there are many more of us who didn't, okay? Um, and who really uh, uh, left the unit, whether they wanted to or not. But having said all that, one of the things about being in contract research that I think was good for Julia and her career was that constant cycle of having to do and complete research to time and different forms of research. And also, when you're an early career researcher, working on other people's research because Julia had uh, experience of that um, and therefore learned not only how other people did research, but also what she could bring and what she could take across different research projects. So that was something I think was a good thing, even though I wouldn't say the conditions were at all good uh, and they still remain not brilliant at all. And then um, one of the things that Julia did and partly fueled by that is draw on narratives of the past to fuel her current thinking and methodological innovation. So she always looked back to the way in which things have been done in other projects, other ways of conceptualizing research and issues, and used those, I think, in very fruitful ways. And she's intellectually syncretic. She brings the best of things together in novel, innovative ways, and uh, as I've said in the paper, those intertextual narratives, those drawing on other themes, really help. Okay? And they also help it when it comes to thinking about context in a multi-level way. Because one of the things that, that also being in a research unit did was that it avoided methodological dogma. We always worked quantitatively and qualitatively, even though it took Julia to theorise mixed methods in a different and new way. But we always did that. And we always thought about the context as being micro and meso and macro. And it's you know, what we did with that that was, was important. And Julia was very helpful there. And in the paper as well, I talk about the way in which Julia has been central to constructing collaborative capacity. And I'm going to say a little bit more about that in a moment uh, in a slightly different way. And then the turn to language, no surprise, uh, Julia's been interested in, and one of the things that always struck me when I was an early career researcher in, Julia, in what was Julia, Julia's room, first of all, um, and then our room, is that she was interested in how people said things and you know, what sort of questions produced what sort of answers and that the two things really mattered. So language was always important, mixed methods always important to her. And then narratives of lives, temporality, and turning points play through her research. So that's all I want to say about the themes from the paper. And then the section I've called methodological imagination. And not surprisingly, now Anne's already drawn on C. Wright Mills, and Julia draws on C. Wright Mills, the sociological imagination. 
And I think that she's used it for the methodological imagination very well to cultivate methodological relevance. And I won't read all this out, but really see Wright Mills talking about the way in which the personal troubles of milieu and the public issues of social structure are important as they come to be of direct relevance to urgent public issues and insistent human troubles. And I think that's key to Julia's work, that um, we think about uh, you know, public issues and, and personal troubles and personal issues, structure and the personal. And that's always been at the heart of what Julia has done. But then I think this also from C. Wright Mills and the, the beginning of the book, um, the capacity to shift from one perspective to another and to build up a view of a total society and of its components, all really important. And that the sociological imagination can be cultivated. Well, Julia has both cultivated her sociological imagination, but also cultivated the methodological imagination from it. And I like Wright Mill's notion of there's a playfulness of mind back of such combining, as well as a truly fierce drive to make sense of the world. Because we've all said how lovely Julia is, undoubtedly true, but that doesn't mean that she's a wimp <laughs> by any means. Um, and uh, Julia can be critically engaged quite fiercely with ideas and things that she think don't stand up. Um, and that's also, for somebody early career <coughs> and mid-career and later career, very useful insight to see and to see how it's done. So I've learned enormously from all sorts of things about Julia's work, the fierceness, the softness, and uh, the critical engagement. But I think that to, to draw on the methodological imagination, what Julia's brought is a secure positioning in sociology. She knows her own discipline, and that's important. One of the things I remember Julia saying often is you can't have interdisciplinarity. It's actually multidisciplinarity. Interdisciplinarity would be very difficult. You know, you, you, know, you have to be secure in your own discipline and uh, really know it and know it well and so on. And it's hard enough to do multidisciplinarity, important as it is. So certainly recognising that, but from a rooting um, and therefore a rooting out uh, from sociology. And always loving theory. Julie's been uh, theoretically engaged all the time that I've known her and very much concerned, as Wright Mills was, with the personal troubles, so the everyday, and doing methodology. Performativity, I think, is at the heart also of what Julia has really brought afresh to the unit and, and beyond to um, social research because she does methodology in practice in very interesting ways. And I think, therefore, she would fit into what Rose Wiles and others say is innovation because, you know, the things that she's done, and we've heard from, from, from Ros and Anne so far, have diffused out. They haven't just stuck with her or in her writings, but they've had impact um, in the best sense of the word. Okay. And then Julia's followed through theoretical and political commitments, and I just want to give two examples. Ros already talked about that 1980s feminist concern to open up the black box of the family. And one of the things that Julia was interested in, obviously, from a feminist perspective, is to think about women in families. So, you know, resources within households was very much about that. And it was, a, I think, a wonderful group where, you know, some of the people in, in the room came and presented papers and um, uh, where we really thought about how households were differentiated in terms of how resources came in, how they were used, how they went out and so on in so many ways. And then a, a book was produced from that, which you saw Ros put up earlier. But also, um, I think that led on to uh, her concern with childhood studies because she was concerned not only with women, mothers, and with fathers, but with children as well in households. So uh, some, some of the things that I was really struck by were her work on children's own views. So for example, the, the, the book that was produced with Anne Oakley, Pamela's story, and so on, which was on um, young people and family life, but also this book on connecting children, which um, was with younger children as well, and led to a film of children talking about family 
that Julia then you know, held an event where she showed this and, and we, we all got into engaged discussion about um, you know, children in families and what they want from their parents and so on. And I think you know, at the time people were not really using film in that way. So for me, that was innovative. And then Julia's been really good at creating epistemic communities. Um, and here, to quote Richard Riccardi, uh, or rather, I won't quote perhaps, just say, say what he says, that there isn't a common definition about what collegiality is. And I think both Anne and Ros mentioned collegiality is important for Julia. But there isn't a common definition about it. But all the surveys that are ever done in US, not UK, um, universities, find complete agreement that what matters, and perhaps more than anything else for scholars, is collegiality. It's what makes a, a life worth living in research, even though it's often not done terribly well. Okay? So here, apparently, even ahead of compensation, which I think means um, not compensation for having to go to work, but you know, <laughs> just pay. No, just pay, but anyway. Um, so collegiality is important, and I think one of the things that Julia's done collegially is to create communities around knowledge, epistemic communities. And she's done that by creating reciprocal relationships between collegiality, you know, so that, that I think that really uh, she was a force for um, uh, people feeling that there was something coherent in the unit. And I think the TCRU has been, you know, a fantastic place for many of us to work in. You know, I mean, an exemplary place in terms of collegiality and so on. And certainly Julia um, contributed to that. But she's done it also reciprocally by nurturing international links. And I think Anne, uh, even though she didn't say that, represents that really well. This has been a 25-year year, um, uh, relationship you know, across the water. Okay, um, <laughs> that sounds a bit odd, but uh, <laughs> nonetheless. <laughs> um, you know, and with other people as well. So international links, and those are so important for thinking methodologically, seeing other ways of doing things, having other possibilities for, for data collection, for thinking about research and so on. And she's had enduring collaborations. You know, it's no surprise that many people in the room have worked with Julia for a, for a very long time and known her for a long time. And then exposure to multiple methods for lots of people. Um, so she's drawn on collegial links in order to really highlight and think further about mixed methods. And when you think about the people she brought together in the conference Ros mentioned, for example, and the people she brings together in other conferences, they are people who are the best at what they're doing, who she consistently can bring together to think in new ways. And I think um, certainly not, not last in terms of commitment or importance here, a political commitment to equality. And how we thought about equality was something that we talked about a great deal, thought about sometimes in the unit. And Julia and Peter, Pat, I mean, people in the room, were really key to uh, you know, making, for example, me feel that this was a place it was worthwhile being in, actually. You know, so. And then nurturing critical mass in a different way. Capacity building is something that Julia's been very committed to and uh, continues to want to do. This is something that she sees as one of her key roles as a mid-career and then a very senior um, uh, academic. And here, just to quote Nancy Fraser, from um, the new school in, in the USA, in New York. Uh, just to, well, not to read it all, but talking about how she belonged to a generation of women who did their graduate work in the 1970s and had a tough time because, you know, they were often the only woman in, uh, and she's talking about philosophy, and it was hostile climate. Now, Anne's talked about how, you know, actually at the time Julia did a degree, relatively few people did a degree and even fewer women. And she's continued, you know, sort of very few uh, women are relatively still professors um, in the academy. But uh, Nancy, the reason I chose this quote was Nancy Fraser talks about how it was different for her. And it was different because uh, the City University of New York had a significant cohort of women PhDs. 
And I would argue that Julia helped to create a significant cohort of women in the unit who felt comfortable to be there and could speak out. And that that makes a difference. That helps to nurture critical mass and it helps to build capacity as well. Uh, for those who, who are feminists and those who are not, it really doesn't matter. It, it, it helps. Okay, and then um, I think that what Julie has also done, and I, I mentioned this at the beginning, is to capitalise on her personal characteristics and the institutional culture both. So, you know, make, uh, making strengths of both of those. So joining a research unit focused on policy relevant research on households with children and families in the 80s. So the 80s, really important time, because I think that, you know, one of the things that was lovely was that Peter, lovely for me anyway, Peter brought me in to do a research project where I ended up having five years working on one thing. I mean, you know, early career researchers now cannot dream of that, okay, uh, in the same way. Thank you, Peter. Um, and, uh, you know, and thank you, Julia, for the, for the generosity around that, because, you know, it was Julia who, um, when uh, a publisher asked if I'd write a book, on the research that you know was Peter's research and that Julia had helped me with, it was Julia who said, "Well, do it on your own." You know, when I, you know, it was going to be everybody, the whole research team. Um, you know, which would have been good as well. I'm sure they would have produced a fantastic book. <laughs> but indeed, what happened was then that Peter and Julia read every word again and again and again, and Julia, you know, mentored me um, uh, through the writing of that book. Uh, really, including after I started tapping on the computer, I uh, began to, to get on her nerves with it, <laughs> with it, you know, sort of in a wonderful way. So the timing was really important. And um, one of the things that, that that generational cohort could see was that it was important to have a range of methods without methodological dogma. I've mentioned that already. But it was also a time when feminism was on the rise in the academy. And what that meant was that there was another avenue for the interrogation of uh, and innovation in methodology. Now, feminism is actually, um, if you read somebody like Sarah Ahmed, for example, who's just set up a centre for women's studies at Goldsmiths, on the, on the slide in the academy, it's a different time. So the timing really mattered, and Julia was able to draw on that um, with, with feminist research being one strand of the influence on her work. But then I've mentioned already the, her experience of a range of different research areas and the fact, I think, that she is both creative and able to do the, the craft skill of research. And another reason that it's good to have been in, in several research projects and in research units is that one has to complete on time. Whatever the pressures, whatever else you're doing, however many nights you have to then stay up, and what, however many weekends you have to do, there isn't much slippage in sort of when you have to deliver things and deliver them to high quality and also um, to know that somebody be, will be waiting. You know, sort of a, I remember um, sort of project meetings where, for example, I would have to say, I haven't finished that coding yet. It seems to be taking me longer than I thought, <laughs> you know, um, or whatever. And yet people were nice to me, but made it quite clear. That <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Julia. <laughs> but it was really important. So that craft skill, as well as the creativity, both important, but also seeing that Julia published both on method and substantive issues and right from the beginning, and that she published and that she did a PhD. And I then followed her uh, into doing a PhD on this same project that Peter got the funding for. So you can see, I could say thank you all day long, but um, <laughs> just to wrap up, um, I think that, that there are some things that are particular to, to Julia. One of them is that she is curious about the social life, about the personal and the structural, about politics and uh, you know, individual family lives. So she has an everyday ethnographic interest and that, for me, was highlighted uh, the weekend before last when she went to a wedding and she came back and she had all, th all the stories from several women of their lives, <laughs> of their... <laughs> and she could lay out and theorise for me what was going on. And, <laughs> 
and uh, locate it in the part of the, the country in which it was situated, and so on. So, you know, curiosity, interest, people being willing to talk to her, being a wonderful interview without people knowing they're being interviewed, <laughs> and um, really being able to, to do something with it and theorize it and think about it, and then it would have an influence later in thinking about how things are and so on. So I think that that is a real gift. And she's analytically insightful, which means that, as I said before, she is no wimp, but um, is critically engaged. And she will <coughs> say if she disagrees with an approach, if she thinks work is shoddy, if um, uh, things are not going well, and in the nicest possible ways, because I think that to be criticised by Julia is actually very strengthening. You know, it, you, there is no point in the academy in always having people say, you're fantastic. I mean, as we know from US work on developmental psychology, that um, US children often have high self-esteem when they're hopeless at all sorts of things. <laughs> you know, and it isn't necessarily a good thing, okay. Uh, syncretism, I've mentioned already. And then skillful argumentation. I think anybody who knows Julia will know that she's able to write argumentation in the, in the billig sense, I mean, so from classical scholarship, really well, and also to talk very eloquently too, and a clarity of thinking, speaking and writing, as well as forever thinking about methods and substantive issues and <coughs> rethinking them. Hence, um, uh, calling my, my paper in the special issue, Reframing Relevance. Thank you.